Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is a pleasure to, to see you. We will just give our friends who we have walked this journey with for quite a while now to, to also join. And then we will kick off the webinar. Karibuni sana. Um, you, as usual, you can, you can post in the, in the chat. A good morning. Um, where you're joining from? Uh, you can post your business as we wait for the other guys to to join. Welcome, uh, Mr. Sembea. Right, I've just enabled chat so that everyone can chat to everybody. Um, Roland joining us from Karen, Karibu Sana, Rafael from Nairobi, Billy from all the way from Bogoma, Karibu Sana, to the ninth session. Uh, Rafael, uh, Fresh Produce Consortium of Kenya from Nairobi, Karibu Sana, Joyce, it's good to see you again from Nairobi, Lilian from Lily Cupcakes, Tengela, Lily is a baker, Fanny is from Kisumu, Eric, Karibu, Adrian, greetings to you as well from Taveta, um, Dixon, Victor from Kakamega, Felix joining us from Mombasa, Benson from Nairobi, Sylvester, Good morning to you as well. Claire, Jacqueline. Jacqueline, welcome again. Migori. Santeni Sana. Dr. Vinod. Dan. Karibu Sana. You had the chance to say a few things last time. I think even today, as we proceed, um, if somebody carries up their hand and would wish to speak, we will, we will allow that. Nashon, so many people, just Kalina, also, who's also a baker, Ruth, Katela, Nairobi, Sumba from Nairobi, so many of you, uh, Chambea from Kwale, thanks now, and I know that, <laughs> and now the, the name uh, and the place are making much more sense suddenly. Um, Kenneth Orero from Nairobi, Dennis, Nicholas, and so, so many of you. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, all those whom I have not managed to mention by name, you're welcome to the session. We are glad to host you one once again for the second last time, perhaps the third last time, um, to this sessions of the GTB and KBA training. Um, last week, we delved deep into um, digitization of our business, brand visibility through digitization. Um, I hope all of you who wished to contact the trainer thereafter, and those who struck deals with the trainer within the, within the call, I hope you managed to, Sami from Otto, thank you for joining. Uh, I hope you managed to get in touch with them and I hope you got some help. Uh, that's the kind of thing that we continually want to, want to see. Uh, now, today is a very special day for us because uh, not just for us, but I think for you as well, uh, because uh, the bank, Diamond Trust Bank runs one of the pillars of our strategy is actually sustainability excellence. So it is right up there with our quest for larger customer acquisition. It is up there with our digital transformation agenda. And the third of it is actually um, sustainability excellence. And um, what a way to have a second last session as sustainability. So we have in the room uh, a person who's 
might be new to you, but not new to us as the bank, because what she has done is we have had previous sessions where we brought in our customers as a bank together just to continue to create awareness on sustainability uh, so that we are joining together you know, so that we could share with you what we are doing in the sustainability space, but bring in experts like our today's trainer to, to give us views and, and perspectives from that's that's industry wide. It's cutting across industries. So our trainer today is Christian Buru. Christian Buru uh, is currently attached to the World Bank, and she consults for very many institutions uh, across countries. Uh, she is attached to the World Bank, and she is an expert in the field of sustainability and environmental social governance practices. And today, I think we were having a chat with her earlier. She has outlined her presentation in a manner that is really intriguing. And I can't wait to, to, to hear from her. And I know that you will also greatly benefit. So please go ahead and be very interactive as possible. Ask as many questions as possible. Um, we hope that this, this um, call is clear you can hear very well and in the event that you cannot hear do do raise that on the chat we will try and sort it from from this end um, but between now and 12 12 30 we'll delve deep into sustainability um as as uh, as conducted by christian and what it means for our businesses your businesses and how you can take advantage of it so Karibu Sana Christine, our sign language interpreter is Abigail. She'll be assisted by uh, Brenda and you can access the sign language interpretation screen by clicking on the interpretation um, icon that's below your screen and clicking on American Sign Language. Now I'd like to welcome Christine Karibu Sana. Uh, please take us through this training. Christine, you're still you're still muted. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And as you as you begin, I'd also like to say that I'm joined by my colleagues Josiah and Derek Irungu, who are on the call. Um, they'll be helping us throughout throughout the call. Yes, Christine. Okay. Thank you very much, Ali, and for the introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. I hope uh, we all had. Uh, we're all having a good morning. And um, I'd like to thank you also for making the time to um, participate in this um, session. Um, so again, my name is Christine Buru. I am a consultant um, for the World Bank, IFC. Uh, my work, uh, I my main work is to support uh, financial institutions in enhancing their sustainability and environmental and social governance um, practices. Um, I am both a consultant in my past life and, 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 and a banker, and now back to um, consulting within the environmental and social and governance um, space. And um, so currently what I do is um, I support um, different institutions, banks, and, and, and companies um, in their sustainability journey. Um, so I uh, welcome you to this presentation and I hope it will be useful to you in one way or another um, in, in better understanding what sustainability means for your business. Um, um, I hope you will be um, engaged and uh, ask questions. Um, I welcome questions within um, the presentation. I think Ellie will um, handle that for us and um, please I encourage you to, to ask um, as many questions as you'd like. So without um, further ado, we'll, we'll begin the presentation. <clears throat> so um, it's structured in three parts. Um, the first part is um, an introduction to sustainability um, and why that is important for your business or why it is important in general. And then we'll go and look at some business cases that talk about um, the business risks and opportunities that come with, you know, considering uh, sustainability in your business. 
And um, finally, we we'll look at practical application steps. If you wanted to integrate sustainability in your business, how do you go about it? What are the things you consider um, for your business? And we will conclude. So um, after each part, we'll have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, but in the meantime, you can um, send your questions through the chat and we will handle them at the end of each um, at the end of each session. So before we begin, um, you'll allow me to switch off my video. So um, for the purposes of improved um, quality of presentation, um, I believe you've all seen my face and you're not talking to some AI, uh, artificial intelligence being. I am uh, live and um, with you, but please allow me to um, switch off my video so um, the call quality is, uh, or the presentation quality will not be compromised. Thank you. So as we begin, <clears throat> I'd like to begin by asking you, um, how familiar are you with the concept of sustainability in your business? Um, and, and, and maybe you could just um, give the number that um, you feel comfortable with um, in the chat, just for an understanding of um, where the different um, uh, businesses you, that you represent are in terms of understanding or integrating um, sustainability considerations in your business. So the, the, the first uh, point is I am very familiar with the concept of sustainability or ESG and apply these concepts in my business or maybe I am familiar with the concept of sustainability, but um, I am able to apply it into my business. Number three uh, category would be, I have some limited familiarity with the concept of sustainability. And uh, number four being the last one is, I have never heard of sustainability or ESG. So this is the first time you're getting a basic introduction into um, what that means. And you could just quickly just um, share the number that you feel comfortable with um, for the reality of your business in the chat, and and then we'll just be able to um, get a better understanding of where everyone is as as we proceed. I'll just give you exactly one minute to just quickly comment in the chat as as we as we proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. The response is really coming in, and. Uh, most of them are centered around number three, actually. Mm -hmm. um, towards 70% of them are centered towards number three. Um, about another 20% look to be centered around number two. And then there's a 10% chance that there's, that there's a 10% there's very few people who uh, mention number four. And as, as more people are responding, the trend seems the same. Um, I'm yet to see any response on number one. Okay. There is, there is, they're still coming in. Um, okay. Um, a few more on number four. A few four. more seconds in. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, a few more seconds to, to respond. Um, Dr. Vinod, number, okay. number two. Uh, Rodney, three. Mr. Sumba three, Sami three, uh, Kimani three, Dennis four. Yeah, so the trend is the same. Um, okay. seventy percent okay. seem to be centered on number three, and that twenty percent. Uh, there's finally we have number one that is not fully applied. It's applied, but not fully. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Okay, yes. so at least I know I'm not um, talking uh, Greek um, as a language. Um, I think uh, what I have to communicate will be um, useful. And um, it would be interesting to just get um, feedback um, from the different um, levels of application um, in terms of how you see this panning out um, post this uh, training session and uh, taking into consideration the evolving uh, environment around sustainability for businesses. So again, I welcome you. Um, so thanks, Eli. I think we'll proceed. Yes, um, so you, some background you. context. 
um, when you look at SMEs, and this is um, global statistics, and it's also the it's also true um, from an analysis by the Kenya Federation of, of Employers. Um, SMEs have a very very um, special place in, in in business, mostly because they account for quite a bit of of, of um, the employment numbers. Um, uh, if you look at uh, the Kenya Federation of Employers, and if you look at uh, uh, GDP wealth creation. So SMEs are considered to take up over 90% um, of the employment space or the employer um, profile and GDP contribution to, to, to any given um, environment in which they operate. Um, so um, it is true for Kenya and it is true globally. So you can see just how important um, SMEs are in wealth creation, in job creation, um, and in growth of, of um, any uh, local economy. We also know um, that SMEs are an integral part of the supply chain um, when it comes to service provision, uh, linking businesses to businesses. Um, SMEs are a very important link um, between bigger uh, uh, companies and, and, and you know the primary um, producers of different goods and services. So, Obviously, that that then what that means then is that the success of sustainability um, for Kenya's economy or economic outlook rests quite significantly and on the growth and the resilience of its uh, micro, small, and medium enterprise sector, and that cannot be um, understated. So, um, having gathered here today and and, and and taking part in this presentation, um, you will realize just how important. Uh, you are towards achieving um, whether it is our sustainable development goals as a country, our contribution to our part in, in meeting, um, you know, uh, this concept of net zero um, or mitigating climate change issues, um, SMEs play a very significant role um, in all of that. And we will unpack that as we continue. So what is sustainability? Um, many of us have said uh, we have some familiarity with it. So, but as we delve deep into what it is, um, one thing we need to, 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 to ask ourselves is, even as we consider sustainability, what is the purpose of a business? Why am I in existence as, as a small and medium enterprise? And I think these questions usually come to us or come to the fore of a discussion when we have some challenges, uh, like, for example, the current floods or um, when we are faced with um, environmental or some social um, challenges that impact anyone's business. We find ourselves asking, why am I in existence as a business person or as a business? Um, is the purpose of the business just to make money or is there a bigger purpose? Um, to, 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 to the services I provide? And how will a better economy benefit my business or how will sustainability um, better impact uh, my business? So as we proceed, I'd like you to have some of these questions at the back of your mind, which we will try to unpack and answer and, and see the relevance of as we uh, continue. So sustainability is, is a buzzword among many. You have ESG, you have CSR, yeah. you have sustainability. What do they all mean? Um, so basically, sustainability is a term that was coined uh, during one of the UN uh, meetings uh, many years uh, ago. It's a concept that looks at um, utilization of resources, whatever they are, natural resources, mostly your water, your air, you, the assets that come from land, whether it is mining, agriculture, all those resources you derive from the environment, um, utilizing them in a way that does not compromise um, the ability of future generations to, to also do the same. So in essence, that means taking care of your resources in a way that allows the generations that come after you to be able to you know, eke out a, a meaningful living for themselves. And this concept of sustainability is spread across um, in, in various ways. So it covers issues of climate change. It covers issues of you know, sustainable finance. It covers issues of 
um, the development goals or um, yes, basically um, that, that various countries have signed up for. It also covers the topic of environmental and social governance for, for investors in banks, which is very key and I think is the reason for um, um, today's session that we are having courtesy of, of ETB Bank, for which I commend them. So it's, it's, it's very varied. Um, it's, it's quite um, a, a big concept. And, and, and it basically just um, speaks to good use, wise use of natural, um, and not just natural, but all kinds of resources that, that, that are available to us. Because we, as a people, are also a resource. Uh, the environment we, we, we participate in is, is a resource. And we will look at um, all of that. So in, in, in business, as I just said, um, it refers to uh, not negatively impacting the environment and it incorporates three aspects. So you have the aspect of people, um, taking care of the people, making sure they are not harmed in, in, in the course of doing business, taking care of the planet, which is your environment, making sure that the resources that are there are not depleted. Um, it also looks at profit, the sustainability of the profits that you're earning from your business. In the course of doing business, everyone wants to be, you know, anyone, everyone wants to earn um, income, good income at that um, from the business that they are doing, but at what cost? And that is where sustainability comes in. So um, the, the longevity of your business um, based on how you develop your business plan or how you you know make use of, of of the capital you have, or the people that work for you, or you um man how you manage your relationship with the society, or the people that you engage with, the community that you operate in. All those aspects contribute to sustainability uh, in business. And so the goal of a sustainable business um, is to have a strategy that makes positive impact. Um, in in one or all of these areas, and when there is failure to when the business is unable to do that, then that is where the, these challenges on the question of um, is my is 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 my business just here to make money, or is my business uh, have does my business have um, a greater contribution to society? That's where now those questions come in. So issues such as environmental degradation, inequality, or employment inequality, and social justice are addressed or present themselves when we look at um, sustainability. So if you don't remember anything from um, today's presentation, remember when you look at sustainability, you look at people, planet, and profit. But profit here is, is sustainable profit or long-term profit. So you could actually replace that with prosperity. So remember people, planet, and profit, the three Ps of sustainability. So what do you look at when you consider sustainability in your business? I mean, obviously here we have um, quite a number of varied um, business practitioners, um, I'm sure, uh, cutting across all the uh, major sectors um, of business in this country. So um, your sustainability profile or sustainability concerns will be varied. They will differ from business to business, but they all touch on some different aspects of the environment, some aspects of um, economic performance and some um, social factors. And so, for example, um, in your business, if, for, if, if maybe you're in manufacturing, um, Sustainability could mean using materials that maybe are locally available or easily available or that can be easily recycled in order to reduce the burden um, of you know, getting rid of, of maybe a, a processing um, function within um, your manufacturing process or managing the risk associated with managing that waste. You could also think about um, optimizing your supply chain to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I mean, Kenya, in, in its commitment to something we call our nationally determined contributions, is required to measure um, carbon emissions. That's your, um, your carbon dioxide, your nitrogen gases, your sulfur gases, mostly from uh, manufacturing um, and, and, and optimizing your supply chains to reduce some of these gases 
um, is important in helping the country as a whole achieve its um, its global targets um, for reducing uh, emissions, which um, we all know are responsible for um, things such as uh, increased temperature in the atmosphere, which then impacts things like uh, the onset of hazards like uh, wildfires and drought. So it's 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 um it's a whole chain of events. Um, but I think the key important thing to note here is that um, reducing your carbon footprint, sometimes it's called greenhouse gas emissions in your supply chain is 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 important, not just for your business, but for the country's um, profile as a whole. Relying obviously on renewable energy and for which Kenya is a very big um, contributor to that, um, to, to minimize uh, or rather blend your power production either hedge against uh, power losses or um, optimize your energy uh, efficiency. On the social side, you have um, things like uh, sponsoring education funds for the youth in the local community. This is very big for um, medium and large um, enterprises. They usually have a fund for this and it, it just increases your social license to operate in, in, in your environment and it fosters a good relationship with the community. You have a sense of um, belonging um, in terms of um, acceptability by the community from which you draw your employees. You get um, the security in the sense that uh, you're sure that and your, 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 your business will not be vandalized in the event of uh, maybe some misunderstanding or challenges. So social license to operate is also an important aspect of sustainability because it ensures you your business will be there physically um, and, and safe um, for the most part for quite some time and you'll be able to you know continually get good quality uh, employees um, as you grow your business. So another reason why sustainability is important is because um, it is proven that companies with high ESG ratings or sustainability ratings um, have a lower cost of debt and equity. This may be um, true for countries in the developed nations. Um, in Kenya and in Sub-Saharan Africa at large, we are still looking towards you know, um, improving our processes, improving our um, understanding of sustainability and integration into our businesses. So the, the data around developing ESG ratings that then affect uh, or impact our ability to get good quality loans is not as advanced as in the developed countries, but this is something that is coming up. Um, this is a consideration that also um, lenders are making when they are considering credit worthiness of a business. And we will see this increasingly, this aspect of ESG increasingly becoming important in, 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 in reviewing um, the ability of a customer to take up a loan and, 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 and to get preferential um, interest rates uh, when they are borrowing. So it's something to, to, to think about and, and to consider when um, as, as you continue to do business, because in the coming years, it will be an important aspect of access to credit. Obviously, um, sustainability initiatives can help improve your financial performance um, from avoiding um, certain costs, um, such as maybe if you were to install um, solar power, and I don't know if we have members of the audience who've done this, who have realized such benefits, um, blending um, solar power with KPLC power maybe saves um, a few coins here and there, and over a period of time that becomes a significant um, cost saving for your business, and and that improves your your you know your business sustainability because you have you have freed up some capital to you know um, build up your business. So when we talk about improving financial performance, those are some of the aspects um, to consider whether you're saving on energy or you're using more sustainable materials that, you know, it doesn't always have to be financial impact, but impact in general. Say, for example, you use um, locally available material as opposed to uh, importation. When you use that locally available material, you have contributed to the local economy. So it may not be a financial, it, it may not change um, your financial outlook in terms of procurement, of, of of resources, but you will have contributed to the local um, GDP, which is good 
um, for social uh, and economic welfare of the country. And I think that's 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 a big um, area that the government has been trying to advocate for in terms of um, local brands, local production, and, and, and local consumption. So again, obviously we have your, your access to market um, through sustainability initiatives. This is, um, there is a lot of growth around green and sustainability labels. Um, in certain industries like the flower industry, these um, environmental certifications for maybe energy savings or for um, a good production systems or efficient production systems allow you to access markets both locally and internationally, especially in the European market. And I'd like to stress this because for those of you who might um, be looking towards you know, exporting uh, goods and services to maybe the European market. This is a very key area that is looked at um, by the EU um, regulators um, and, 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 and sustainability considerations, whether it's how you in, um, treat employees or how you your production process is like, um, the efficiencies within maybe producing uh, fabrics, or producing uh, butter and cheese, whatever your production process is, the efficiencies within um, that process and, and the outcome of the goods and services you produce from that process, uh, the greener they are or the more sustainable they are, the better access you have to um, foreign markets, preferential access actually to, to, to foreign markets. And at, at this rate, I think the EU has come up with laws where they are saying if if it's um, if you cannot demonstrate sustainability in how you produce your goods and services, we will not accept your, your products in the EU market. <clears throat> so that's a very um, important um, area to, to consider for businesses that have um, supply chains that extend beyond Kenya. <clears throat> Obviously, we've spoken about um, affordable credit. Market share is your usual uh, customer base. Uh, how many customers are you able to attract because of the uniqueness of your product or the quality um, of, of the products that, that, that you offer? So another reason, we've, we've looked at the benefits of sustainability and why it's important, but let's look at the inverse. Um, if you if 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 um, you have challenges um, incorporating sustainability, or if you are unable to, or if you have um, some risk exposure, what does that mean for you? And let's begin with looking at what that means for your lender. And this is a study that um, I'm sorry I have a bit of a cold, so my voice may be strained as we continue to speak. But I hope uh, I'm, I'm still uh, audible enough. So the IFC did um, a survey um, in, in seven countries, and it was looking at around 56 banks in, in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa. And um, it was looking at the considerations for sustainability, how banks are integrating sustainability in their portfolios and what that uh, and the risks that were coming out um, either from inefficiencies, in, in integration and in, in, in engagement with the clients or different aspects. So there were quite a number of risks that came up. And for the lenders such as DTB, um, I'm not saying DTB was among them, but um, taking DTB as an example, there is an issue that came up of um, reputation um, because maybe um, some of the fines that they lent um, uh, contributed to either degradation of the environment or contributed to issues like um, the scandals that we, we see um, are happening. Maybe buildings, um, they, they give money to a customer who built a, a complex in the riparian area and, and, and you know, they got uh, repercussions for it from the environmental regulator. So is issues around reputation um, another aspect of reputation is governance, uh, good leadership, and that cuts across both the bank and its clients. And it's something um, perhaps as a country uh, we have challenges with in the areas of corruption, 
and, and provision of good leadership for businesses. Um, you will see in some of the examples I will give that governance is a very important aspect of sustainability. Um, we look at it as a, maybe operations or as we just call it leadership, but it really contributes to the sustainability of a business. Um, obviously for the bank's credits, defaults from uh, customers who are unable to pay for various reasons are, are um, also a key risk for the bank. But then for the client themselves, you, you yourselves as business um, men and women, what, what, what are the potential risks that come up um, when, when sustainability considerations are missed in the business operations? Obviously, there are issues like disruption of operations. You will know um, better than me, some of you, especially in the manufacturing industry, uh, NEMA sometimes when they decide to do their random checks on compliance, uh, we hear certain uh, factories were closed um, here and there because we're unable to comply. You will hear that uh, buildings are being demolished because they were built in the wrong area. You will hear people being, companies being sued for emitting waste into maybe the river or sewers without um, proper um, you know, compliance to waste management regulations. You will hear um, companies being sued because their employees either died or um, suffered uh, work-related um, injuries because they were not given the correct PPEs. And all those are risks that um, are within the sustainability space that sometimes maybe we rank, we or we look at as operational risks. Yeah. But, but, but in reality, um, there are sustainability risks and they're important to consider for the long-term a value that a business has to realize. So among all those risks, disruption of operations was highest, followed by legal and environmental issues. Uh, the environmental court in Kenya is quite strong in, in prosecuting um, environmental related crimes and so on and so forth. The list is varied and it depends on, on you know, the different kinds of, of, of businesses or operations that um, a business undertakes. So this is just uh, another elaboration. Hi, hi, Christian. Sorry, as you as you proceed, I I think yes. um, there's a there's a concern that um, the screen might be blank. I don't know if that's the case for everybody, but um, perhaps we can try and reshare. Okay, let me do that now. Thank you. Thank you. I can see it from my side. And um, if, if, if any of our participants, you're not able to see it, please just um, uh, let us know on the chat and we'll sort it. Thank you. Christine, thanks. We can continue. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> so another reason why sustainability is important, and I think we've, we've um, delved into some of this, is for a business that has uh, taken up facility a loan facility um, from from the bank uh, and and you you're caught up in some of these um, issues either um, you've been asked by NEMA to comply um, with certain uh, licensing requirements or face the threat of closure or customers have decided they no longer are interested in your products because maybe they um, did something, um, and I, I, I draw you to the example of um, a lead uh, recycling plant in, in Mombasa. Um, at some point, uh, they, were, they were sued by, by, by the local community through um, an NGO, and uh, they were forced to close down because for very many years they had been recycling uh, lead batteries in a manner that was not um, conducive in terms of um, air and, and, and soil pollution. And it caused a lot of people to, to suffer. A lot of children um, suffered various diseases um, and their lives were altered. 
Um, and so if you look at the perspective of that business, um, it presents a credit risk because they can no longer operate. They've been shut down. And when you look at the bank, then the bank is not able to realize the credit that they've given to this business. And so it becomes um, a cascading effect. Um, so the business is affected and the lender is also affected from a credit um, perspective. Your liability is obviously um, legal suits um, at the environmental court and bad reputation, uh, media coverage, um, which we know is all um, um, an important way of keeping um, businesses on their toes in terms of um, compliance. And now, nowadays, the issue is not just media coverage from you know your TVs, but um, people have taken the onset of mobile phones and, and, and good uh, social networks. It makes it very easy for negative news to to you know um, to 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 travel very fast. So if you find yourself in a compromised position as as a business, whether the allegations are verified or not, it's very easy for you to suffer adverse uh, reputation mentions in social media. You know your WhatsApp, your Instagram. A lot of these things move around very fast, much faster than it is possible for you to mitigate against. You know. Um, negative uh, mentions. So it's, it's really important from a reputational risk point of view um, to be able to um, do the right thing so that uh, the quality of your business and, and, and the media uh, coverage is not, you know, um, adverse for you. So question, um, considering um, this short uh, session we've had on, on sustainability, uh, what that means and what it looks like, how, how do you think your business is positioned to take advantage of um, sustainability opportunities? I'm sure um, Considering the majority of, of, of the answers we got from the poll say they have some limited familiarity with sustainability. How do you think uh, your business can, can benefit from now beginning to apply um, some of these concepts? Um, Thanks, Christian. And as, 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 as people begin as people begin to answer, there was, there was a very interesting comment made by uh, Shah uh, earlier on, mm -hmm. um, who actually posted that uh, their business is running on solar power with KPLC mm -hmm. being just mm -hmm. a backup. Mm -hmm. is, is, would, 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 is that a concrete good example? Um, would, would you like us to perhaps give them a chance to, to talk about whether it's beneficial to them and the positive effects that they think it has. Yes, please. I think that that's that's a very good um, example of um, energy efficiency in your process. And maybe you could just give us some pointers on how that has um, impacted on your business performance um, from a, an operations um, point of view after installing the solar power. All right, I'm, I'm going to allow you to talk. Um, uh, Tavi, I hope I pronounced it correctly, Sha. I'm going to allow you to talk now. If you're available, you can unmute. Hi, hi. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, it's been like I've been following the uh, series since the inception, and today's topic has been of utmost um interesting and important. Um, I I'm a small scale. I'm an insurance agency. I run, but the thing is that the cost in terms of, of um, you know, the, the energy costs have gone so high. So right now when you're on, on solar power, you do not have any, um, uh, you know, power costs. I don't have any power costs. Um, I don't have any downtime that in case there's, you know, a, you know, Kenya power has so many issues uh, now and then. Um, so I don't have any downtime in work time 
so the, my staff are always on duty and there's no excuses or oh, the servers are not working the laptops are not working so that has made a major impact in way i do my business and also when i have i i'm also very environmental conscious meaning i have a lot of trees and a garden where you know there's a lot of fresh energy coming in so when whenever my staff are feeling down they can go out enjoy the garden have some fresh air and come back into the office so it's made a big impact in the way i do business um with solar backup and a garden around me so there's a lot of fresh energy fresh air into the business as well amazing thank you amazing. May, may we ask what, what's what's for for business like yours what's what's the capacity of your solar installation uh well that's a bit of a technical question for me <laughs> <laughs> but i can say i'm running yeah. on uh on six six solar panels with four power back uh batteries mm -hmm. so it sustains and then i have cctv and i have alarm system which all runs uh, i have a fridge a microwave i have about a whole series of laptops computers and servers so everything is run actually on that solar solar power throughout the day and with the weather being a bit down uh but mm -hmm. still it's sustaining us great okay, amazing and, and you you yeah you you you'd, you'd be in, you'd be pleased to know that timothy says i love that so much <laughs> and and rose wanjala echoes that it's amazing um but thank you, thank you for sharing your 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 what you're doing with sustainability. Christine, you want to say something about that? Because there's another comment in the chat as well. Yeah, maybe just um one last um question to Pruvi. Um, how how long did it take you to offset the cost of installing your solar power? Um as opposed to oh. using KPLC. So how how many months or a period of time did it take you to recover your installation cost? It will take, well, I finished two years. I still have one more year before, I mean, I'll have then come to a zero uh, electric cost because I just installed it about two years back. Okay. So it costed me about, it, it did cost me quite a, a substantial amount, but it obviously to, off, you know, to recover that cost, ROI on that is, uh, I still have one more year before I'll have a return on investment on the solar power. Okay. And for you, it's definitely worth it. I mean, compared to oh, um, or, yeah, because you're getting clean energy, and then there's also less, uh, uh you know, um, there are no uh, power fluctuation, power surges that will also, um, you know, have uh, issues in your systems. Yeah, that is very true. It's clean power, so you don't have any fluctuations or anything. So you don't have also machinery breakdown and computers breaking down or having these. Power, power surges affecting your power systems of the computers are, are, are basically zero now. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you very much for um, sharing that with us. You're welcome. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for attending all the sessions from session one. We, we're glad to host you for all the sessions. Um, uh, on, on that same note, before I read... Uh, your namesake, Christine, your namesake, who's doing something amazing as well, uh, is that at DTB also, we took the step to actually install solar at, at, on the rooftops of the building. And of course, for us, it's 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 come through because all, nearly 20% of our energy needs now come from the solar installation. And that has cast has cut down our our electricity costs by a lot. And you'd be interested to know that our payback period is nearly similar to that of uh, Pavi Shah. We are also looking at a period of three years. Ours was just installed early this year. And by the end of by the end of uh, three years, we will be we'll be getting 20% of our energy needs from the sun. Um, we will not have to be spending a dime on it. And 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 you know for us, the, the revolution is good because what we're seeing is employees are now starting to take the step towards doing simple things like uh, trying to purchase electric cars. And you know, when they come here, while that might increase electricity costs, it gets offset because some of these electricities actually come from the sun. We're not paying, we're not paying for it. 
Um, but but I think that's a very good idea. So you can imagine if Sha is running an insurance company, and I've seen a lot of businesses here that are bakeries. I've seen some that are schools. Um, I've seen somebody from Standard Investment Bank. You can imagine the kind of benefit that you can accrue from installing solar um, while uh, at the same time advancing the interests of the environment. Uh, thank you so much. Now, Christine, allow me to read the, your namesake, Christine Massess's uh, comment. She says, I embrace recycling and upcycling in my fashion brand to lengthen the life cycle of my products so I can avoid adding to environmental pollution. And if you allow me, uh, if you're available, Christine, I can uh, allow me to unmute you. You can tell us just a little bit about this as well. Uh, you're allowed to talk, you can unmute. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, uh, Christine. This is Christine. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, DTB, for this series. I've also followed from the very start, and I'm a new customer, almost a year old. So it's very Amazing. nice. Amazing. To actually see uh, a bank that cares and actually helps to build uh, its customers. So I'm a fashion brand and I use uh, mostly cotton fabrics, very vibrant colors to make clothes and accessories. And I noticed that um, if you go by any tailor shop or a market that sells clothes, there's probably a corner that's a dump site, either off cuts or old clothes, things like that. So for me, I encourage my customers yeah. that if you don't need your clothes anymore, since it's a very good quality cotton, you can bring it. I can cut it up and maybe make you a bag or something else. So we really try to avoid contributing mm. to landfills because anyway, already we are mm. dealing with secondhand and all that kind of um, pollution in this city. So I try as much as possible, even if I just go to a market, decide to design maybe a little laptop bag. I'll go to the market, buy an old leather jacket, recycle it, turn that into a laptop bag and someone will use that for maybe five to six years. So in my small way, I contribute to saving the planet. Amazing, amazing. Thank you, Christine. And Ismail says, I'm loving it. Um, Andrea also says amazing job and there's a lot of claps coming in for what you guys are doing. Um, and those are, those are, I think, the good thing is those are practical examples of what even small businesses can do. Um, and, and that, you know, the sustainability thing and ESG is not for the big organizations. And there's so many opportunities, which, you know, the good thing is Christine is gonna take us through those kind of opportunities that are available for, for businesses. Thank you so much, Christine. You want to ask your namesake a question, Christine? Or a comment? Oh, no, no, no. No, uh, maybe yeah. just to say that is a commendable thing to do. Um, and I think uh, it's interesting because I have an example on uh, the impact of the fashion industry or the contribution mm. of the fashion industry to either sustainability uh, or to the inverse. So we will... I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to having more of your comments uh, in the practical... Uh, business assessment session so but thank you very much christine for that thank you we can proceed christine okay so now we come to business risk um, and opportunity and this is basically just a few examples on the various aspects of sustainability remember we said we have three key areas um, of sustainability which is your people your planet and your prosperity which um, we can replace with um, interchangeably used with profits. So we we'll look at um, some examples on people, some examples on a planet, and some examples on, on, on profit, and look at how sustainability feeds into um, some of these. And I'm sure these are examples that are familiar with all of you. They've been in the news. Um, it's um, a matter of public um, information. Uh, it's it's meant for educative purposes only. Um, none of this uh, information or case studies are, that are presented are targeted at any one in one business. Um, so please feel free to, you know, um, and, 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 and engage. 
So the first um, case study um, we have is uh, the Finley um, tea farm. And um, the reason I, I chose to use this is because one, it's um, I think it's been in the media. Um, so it has some quite some good coverage and I'm sure um, it's familiar to uh, many of you. So what happened with Finley's is that uh, the, the, there were allegations um, on uh, harassment of um, employees um, by management of the company. Um, and this falls quite strongly around the uh, social issues, um, social license to operate for the company, um, community, um, conflict and engagement, um, uh, worker welfare, you know, protection of worker rights, provision of um, a safe um, working environment. It's a whole host um, of um, issues around, you know, social um, sustainability. So if we read the case study, um, it's that um, the beverage farm, um, Starbucks, has stopped purchasing tea from Kenya's James Findlay and Company, which was part of agricultural operations that has engulfed, has been engulfed, sorry, in a sex scandal exposed by BBC News. Over 70 women working at a farm operated by James Findlay and Lipton Tea Infusions um, said that they'd been sexually abused by their supervisor. So in the wake of the scandal, um, one of the um, up off takers of tea, one of the biggest off takers of tea, which is Starbucks, issued a statement saying that they were deeply concerned and they took immediate action by suspending all purchases of tea from the Findlay, um, the James Findlay company. And also the um, UK retail chain Sainsbury also indicated it could stop buying tea from local producers. Um, the horrific allegations have no place in our supply chain, um, said the Sainsbury, which is an off-taker in the UK. Um, and the scandal followed a similar one um, uh, of Kakuzi, which um, also was quite a big, um, received, received, sorry, received quite a bit of uh, media attention a couple of years back. So I want us to look at some of the um, socially related issues um, of the business. Um, that, that hit Findlay. Um, the first one here being um, the company is in agricultural operations. We know that um, Kenya relies very heavily um, on agriculture for its GDP contribution. So if you look in terms of earnings, uh, in terms of export, forex and from exportation of tea, that's a major hit um, to the country's GDP, let alone the company itself. You have um, the scandal in itself, um, which is um, violation of human rights, which is a very strong component of a, a social sustainability. Um, it's very it's very key at the heart of um, our external supply chains. Remember, I mentioned earlier in the presentation that for any company wishing to export its goods and services, especially to the European market. Um, there are some very strict considerations um, that the EU takes into account. And one of them is modern slavery and human rights. So these violations are an automatic uh, disqualification um, of this company. And you can see how strongly that has been taken by companies such as Starbucks, which said it would stop um, uh, off taking tea um, from the James Finley as a company. So obviously, it's it's if you look at the risk perspective, we are looking at uh, from a credit risk perspective. Obviously, the company is likely, very likely, to go under if Starbucks is a, a major off taker of the company. You have your liability. Um, many suits they had to settle claims totaling to 2.6 billion shillings. Um, a couple of um, hundreds of millions of shillings. Um, this is a new suit that could potentially hit them. So you obviously have your legal liability. They were sued in the UK successfully and they paid out claims. So again, from um, a, a, a business long-term value um, provision, uh, this company is unlikely to be able to uh, you know, come from underneath of that scandal, unfortunately. Um, and it's a company that has been there for quite some time providing um, good quality tea. 
Um, but then again, um, the inability to manage their social sustainability, um, their social license to operate in the community is likely going to cause them um, to go under from settling claims or from a bad reputation um, that they have suffered. Another aspect to consider is that, um, you know, the very strong remarks from uh, the another retail chain called Sainsbury saying that they may stop buying tea from other local producers. You can see the cascading impact of one company's who are uh, social considerations or um, integration of social sustainability, the impact that has on the local market, on the local tea market. We know Kenyan tea to be some of the best in this world. So you can imagine if of takers decide they're no longer going to buy Kenyan tea because they associate uh, the tea industry in Kenya with you know, violations against human rights or against um, worker welfare. So this has an unfortunate impact, potential unfortunate impact on other local uh, uh, sellers of tea in Kenya, which I think is um, very, very unfortunate for companies that actually have systems in place, um, unlike Finley's to, 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 to take care of their social <clears throat> and their environmental welfare. So um, the blow over time for such um, an event is usually quite a number of years. Um, we don't know how long that will take. And if really uh, Sainsbury's, uh, Sainsbury will you know, go ahead with its uh, uh, allegations to potentially stop buying tea from other local producers. So I have a question to the audience and um, I ask you, um, I've only presented three types of risks. What are the risks do you see um, coming out of such um, such a blowout of 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 uh, a company like this in terms of business performance? From where you sit, if if this was your business, what are the risks do you see yourself being exposed to, and what would you have done? Um, prior to such an incident, what would you have done as a business to uh, mitigate such um, an adverse outcome for your business? Ellie, I don't know how we will uh, you will coordinate that, but it would be useful to hear just some engagements from the audience on um, if you put yourself in the shoes of of, of Finleys and you're a business and of which um, many of the audience members are today, what would you have done differently? If you consider environmental, social, and uh, business sustainability, uh, the three Ps, people, planet, and profits, what would you have done differently to mitigate against uh, this very adverse outcome that Finley suffered? Thank you. I am I'm also writing your question on the chat. Um oh, and I will I'll I'll pick out any responses that uh all right. Any any responses? What would you so yeah, there's a response. Um George Tumbi, thank you for responding, says investigate and hold accountable whoever is found encouraging or actively involved in the self scandal. So I'm guessing that's a corrective measure, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There's an answer here, but staff welfare as, as a preventive measure. What do you think, Christine? Very good, that's very good. Ismail, we are yes. talking about social, yes, we are talking about social sustainability. So mm. employee systems and maybe policies and procedures in place to take care of employee welfare. Um, are grievances, is there a grievance mechanism in, in uh, resting with management that, you know, takes care of employees when employees come? And I'm sure these women, um, they didn't just all come up and at the same time and say they were abused. There must have been a record of, of uh, complaints forwarded to management. So is there a grievance mechanism in place to handle such complaints? How well is a grievance mechanism uh, managed? 
uh, where does it sit? Does it sit with HR? Who, who in top management or top leadership? Remember, I talked about governance as well. Um, there's a very strong aspect of governance that comes out here. So when these issues were raised, what did management do? So that's an indication of the quality of governance um, in this company. So Ishmael, yes, um, employee welfare is a very important aspect of mitigating risk um, for such for this business. Any other? Great, yeah. Um, yeah, and something you've mentioned before, Sandra says, we should allow for whistleblowing. So, and uh, complemented by Christian's answer, adopt, adopt safe spaces for employees to be bold enough to speak out. I, I also think that's important because um, this kind of this this kind of crisis can bring some businesses down, and I, I mean it it is it is better to to prevent them before they happen by allowing some of these things. So allow for whistleblowing, adopt safe spaces for employees to be bold and to speak out. Um, Imelda says have standard operating procedures in workers' welfare and trainings. So we can hold trainings. Um, Paul Ogalo, thank you all for responding. Allocate uh, savings accrued from use machine to empower the locals. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth Kamal says, oh yes, corporate governance here is actually wanting who takes responsibility and for what should be clear. There's so many other responses. Christine, is there any ones you'd like to comment on as I continue reading? Um, um, no, no, maybe um, take a reaction from uh, the participants. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, let me let me see. Uh, uh, Ismail, would you would you may I unmute you so that you can uh, say something? You're available, you can speak now. Okay. Um, as we wait for Ismail, uh, Imelda also added that the company should act. Heads must roll, including senior management involved. Um, George Wagude says, try to incorporate the community engagement in the development of issues of the area. And I think that's really key because it is, it is, it is that century in time of the century when businesses cannot ignore and uh, uh, community issues. That's that's where businesses draw their economic value from, and so must also be involved in in community community issues not just in trying to in trying to be beneficial to those businesses but also to 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 try and work with the community to avert this kind of risk so i agree with you george um sani says uh, policy on consequences have to be very very clear and that includes loss of employment so taking some really uh difficult decisions there uh -huh. uh, sarah says she has seen policy work in places uh, that mitigate against this gender-based actions, right? Um, Sarah, would you like me? Would you be in a position I can unmute you? You say something. If you're able to. Yes, Sarah. Okay, if you're speaking, we can't hear you, but you're unmuted, just in case. Um, Abdul Hakim says, Finley's problems were caused by a manager who had a predatory mindset. So recruitment and appointment of managers should be closely and thoroughly monitored. I think that's also really, really key that it needs to really start from your recruitment as well the kind of people you're recruiting, you're recruiting into the organization. Yeah, it's a very thorough recruitment process. Uh, Kelvin Mancharia says, regular meetings with open discussions could help. I couldn't agree with you, with you more, 
uh, Kelvin. It's 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 in those regular meetings that you know we discuss the tough issues, and without discussing the tough issues, we never really have solutions, right? Uh, ben Isaboke says, enabling environment and inclusive engagement for all, for decision for decision making for all stakes. So what it, what seems to be coming out here, Christian, is that um, first create an enabling environment, create um, and uh, really good and thorough policies. And then follow it up with actions in case of abuse, right? In case of, and stern actions for that matter. And you can imagine the kind of ripple effect when Christine started, she said, yeah, you SMEs are the backbones of these economies. And if you were, if you took really good proper action on these kind of things, you can imagine the kind of ripple effect you can create for the entire, for the entire economy. You know? People, people then become very, very uh, keen when they're working, cautious when they're working with you. Um, because they know that, you know, if, if I'll, I'll give an example at DTB, we have, we have started a process of engaging our suppliers so that we can hold them accountable to the same level of standards that we hold ourselves accountable, right? So we want to work with suppliers who are also trying, not yet there, the, we, we, are, we are all not there yet, but at least trying to get, to get up to that level. So yes, and finally, from us, Matthew says, mainstream the Office of Social and Environmental Safeguards, coordinate safeguard issues into the organization. I couldn't agree more. That's why, um, who was that who said governance was clearly lacking there? Uh, Stanley finally says there should be a proper channel for workers to raise their concerns. Those are the comments we have for now. You can also use the Q&A button. Uh, ah, somebody did actually, Kezia or Damba did and said, a good payment package for employees. Huh? She has a number of a number of a list of things that can be done. So have a good payment package for employees. Number one, number two, develop a positive organizational culture. Mm -hmm. Number three, have a gender desk. It's quite key. I I I I I know that's very key because we are trying to do it here as well. Uh, frequent team building activities. Job fit when recruiting, engage the communities around you. Really, really key answers, Kristen. Yeah, but all those so. exceptional answers. Um, thank you. And and I think one thing I, I would want to reiterate um, on 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 this uh, particular case study is that um, systems do work, and I think that's that's um, what Finley will uh, or has already begun um, looking at in terms of um, further managing potential uh, risks coming out from um, the social aspect of this of their business. So somebody talked about whistleblowing and I think that's a very key over and above having a grievance mechanism. Um, whistleblowing is very important because remember these ladies were reporting to their supervisors. So that is the man management team. So what happens if you're reporting um, such violations to management and management is the one in charge of those violations or that is perpetrating those violations? So the difference between a grievance mechanism and a whistleblowing uh, policy is that the grievance mechanism is a standard a procedural a standard procedure that rests inside the you know management structure of of the organization. It, it it rests with HR most of the time, and and that is used for stand reporting a grievances in a standard manner. But when grievances fail to be addressed in the case of these women, uh, that is where whistleblowing comes into play. Um, and whistleblowing, for it to be effective, usually rests outside the purview of uh, the executive committee or management, daily management of the organization. So it's also important when structuring business to provide, to be aware and be able to provide for the ability of staff to comfortably, you know, know that when the standard mechanisms fail, such as your grievance mechanism, it's also possible to report sensitive issues, which this is one of them, um, to a third party that can then act as a mediator uh, before things blow out of um, proportion in terms of being able to manage. 
So on the one hand, have your systems in place, your policies in place, but also have a fail-safe uh, mechanism, which is your um, whistleblower. Uh, sorry, your whistleblowing policy and your whistleblowing uh, structure to manage uh, some of the more sensitive issues that um, present themselves um, in, in, in worker welfare management. So obviously the biggest opportunity here for Finleys is to learn um, from this and to improve their systems, especially their governance, to improve their, their hiring and their recruitment and overall management of management. I think um, quite a lot of good uh, uh, contributions have been made, so I will not um, go over them again. So let's look at another um, example. This was on social, uh, social welfare and social sustainability. Let's see. The next one is on uh, food shortage. Business risk and opportunity within the food industry. And this alludes to uh, environmental challenges such as a uh, drought in the longer term uh, climate change, which um, I think the agricultural and the agri processing industry um, is impacted by um, increasingly more and more over the years. And, and, and I would really welcome um, uh, the contribution of uh, members in the baking industry or the food processing um, industry to just tell us um, how uh, you're dealing or uh, either mitigating or adapting to um, you know, agriculture or climate related risks that present themselves in your business. But first let's let's look at the uh, at the case study. Sorry. So I am unable to see part of my screen. So this is this is a letter written um, by a company um, to its 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 uh, consumer base, and, it, and they they say this was in 2017. They said if you live in Nairobi, you have undoubtedly noticed that butter, specifically unsalted butter, has become increasingly difficult to find in the past few weeks. The drought in Kenya has inflated food prices throughout Kenya and is now starting to rear its head in the food industry in Nairobi. It's estimated that over 1.1 million Kenyans are living with food insecurity and malnutrition as a direct result of the drought, which is predicted to worsen through early 2017. For your information, this happened in 2017, but um, for those of you perhaps in the dairy industry or the food um, industry that you know uses products such as butter and milk, the same happened early this year. And interestingly enough, it was a global um, phenomenon where drought in many areas, not just Kenya, affected uh, the activity of the dairy industry, such that some of the value added um, products like butter were unavailable in the market for quite a number of months. And then people had to, certain um, retail outlets such as um, Carrefour, your bigger supermarkets were importing butter at astronomical um, prices, obviously with impacts in the baking industry. So we'll continue with the read that says, um, as a small food business that relies heavily on the use of butter and dairy for our produce, sugar pie is beginning to feel the significant effects of this shortage. So this new challenge is forcing us to be more creative in our choice of ingredients. Um, at sugar pie, we continue to provide vegan and gluten-free cupcakes upon request and encourage you to order them as this crisis heightens. So uh, as a mitigation approach, they say we will continue to find alternatives for butter in our baking, as well as creating more kinds of vegan flavors as alternatives to the flavors we serve now. We are obviously committed to providing quality, delicious treats to our customers. So this is a business that has been impacted by drought. So imagine this was in 2017, and again, they get hit in 2023 um, with the same with the same risks. 
Um, so again, from the risk profile, what what do you think? Um, knowing that drought is a recurring concern for the agribees, the agriculture and the agribees um, industry and, and, and the value chain that relies on agriculture. What do you think are some of the approaches or what can you see as some of the clever approaches that the business took um, to manage this risk and what opportunities going forward, knowing our 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 environment, our operating environment, and our natural environment. What are some of the opportunities that the business um, would consider uh, going forward in terms of drought management? Again, I open um, questions and comments um, from the floor. Ellie, over to you. Sorry, am I am I am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. You are. Oh, okay, 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 good, good. We had some members in the food, um, industry. I heard you say we have a participant, um, uh, who's yes. coming from a bakery. Maybe um, you could tell us, um, yeah. what has been your experience in managing uh, some of this. Um, issues in 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 your bakery has it affected you? Has drought affected you, or has sourcing of some of your ingredients affected your business? And how have you dealt with some of those challenges? Mm -hmm. All right, we we have Sandra saying making their own butter from local milk suppliers. Sandra, would you be comfortable? Um, uh, if I unmuted you, can you, you can say something. Let's just try that as we wait for, as I've allowed you to talk, you can unmute. Sandra? Hi, can you hear me? You're, yeah, yeah I, thank but, you. From, from really, yeah, from really far. I don't know if you're able to move a little closer to the... Um, can you hear me better? Yes, we can hear you better now. I, I think uh, going forward or part of the sustainability we would be trying to get local milk suppliers and making their own butter. Um, that would uh, increase maybe their, their the supplier base. Um, assuming that they were relying mainly on supermarket butter or imported butter, and uh, and as well, it would uh, it would also ensure that socially their business is is seen to be supporting the community and and and, and attract longevity. Yeah, that, that those are my thoughts. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sandra, for that for that. Yeah constructive constructive thought and uh, Nani agrees with you who's Janet agrees with you that it is possible uh, for them to make uh, own butter from local milk supply uh, Christine has again come in to say it's good to adopt healthy options vegan diets um, and adjusting their business models by including suppliers with low MOQs. Now, uh, that's that's term. I may not have come across it, but it might be a common term. I don't know, Christine. You want to post the full of it? All right. As we wait for ah minimum order quantities. Thank you. Thank you. Minimum order quantities. Thank you. Thank you for that comment as well. Um, I'm looking for the our friends who mentioned earlier that they own bakeries. Ah, Rafael, how are you doing? I see you're from Fresh Produce Consortium of Kenya. Uh, would you be in a position to, to make a few comments as well? I'm sure I can be helpful. Let me unmute you.
All right, if you're in a position now, you might be able to speak. Rafael? Urandu? It's all right, Rafael may not be in a position to, to speak right now. But yes, those are the few comments coming in, uh, Christian. As they come in, as more of them come in, I think we will we'll point them out. Yeah. But uh, so basically, actually, mm -hmm. just Kalina says mm -hmm. they make butter from local milk. Yes, just Kalina, may I unmute you as well, so that you can share this some of these pieces of what you do with with the rest of us. I'm sure we can also find it very very helpful. Just Kalina. Yeah, environment is a bit too noisy. But thank you. Thank you for the comment. And okay. thank you for what you're doing in your business. Yes. All right. So, so. so basically, what um, I wanted to communicate Kristen. from this. Yes. Kristen, allow me to. There's, yes, a, there's yes. a quite a comprehensive uh, response here again from Kezia that she thinks we need to embrace zero grazing, except especially for nomadic communities. We need to popularize milk from other animals like goat milk, ETC, which is even more nutritious. We need to make more nutritious bread using unprocessed wheat. The current wheat used for bread is harmful to health and therefore environmentally unfriendly. And this is what we were saying, that there's a lot of opportunities when it comes to sustainability. So. It is not that when you start doing sustainable things, then all you're going to be doing is incurring costs, costs, costs. You are you're basically entering into a new space where innovation happens and you go into an, an, an environment where you can do so many other things while, while, while helping our environment and also making money at it. So thank you so much, Kezia, for those comments. Back to you, Kristin. Okay, thanks. And uh, thanks a lot, Kezia. I think that that um, introduces the uh, essence of uh, some of the comments I wanted to make and the particular reason for this case study. It was just to show us um, that when it comes to climate-related climate related risks in, yeah. uh, in business uh, and the hazards that they pose, such as um, drought, there are two uh, major strategies that businesses can adopt. Um, one um, being mitigation, uh, taking mitigation measures and then taking um, adaptation measures. What do we mean by mitigation? By mitigation, we mean looking at uh, strategies or, or alternatives which um, can reduce the risk or our exposure to the risk of perhaps in this case, um, the impact of drought in the business. And I like some of the examples that have come through on engaging local um, supply chains, local farmers, um, looking into issues of zero grazing or engaging with suppliers that you know can, can, can ensure that the quantities of butter or milk we need are available and that they take proper measures to safeguard their own production process um, from the risk of, of drought. So strategies like uh, zero grazing, uh, fodder uh, management or fodder improvement, uh, fodder, uh, you know, this formulation of, of feeds that can be kept for a longer period of time. So in the event that, you know, the cows don't have enough, um, they, they doesn't train enough and cows aren't able to find enough grazing pasture, they're still um, able to the farmer is still able to secure good quality fodder in the duration of, of, of that um, scarcity period. So they're able to maintain um, their supply and, and you're, you're also able to meet your minimum, what was it said? Minimum, um, you know, order uh, for the business. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's a mitigation strategy. Um, the other strategy is to adapt your business to the current uh, situation. It is not ideal because it forces you to take a limited number of options. In this case, this business had to go into vegan uh, uh, products um, such as gluten-free cupcakes. 
um, obviously that was not the preferred um, uh, you know choice of 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 product for the customer base but in light of uh, current or the situation that faced them they had to innovate in order to stay afloat in order to manage uh, their expenses and, and to remain a viable business so mitigation is one strategy um, the key thing about mitigation it has is that it has a lot of options it gives you it's over a longer time horizon it gives you the ability to consider many different solutions or potential solutions to um, the problem you may be facing adaptation on the other hand is dealing with the issue as it arises and trying the best you can to to um, minimize losses and and risks that um, arise so those two strategies are uh, key to managing climate-related um, risks, and you can adapt them into normal business processes where you assess, and we will look uh, at that later on, where you assess your business and determine where you can mitigate against a possible risk and where you can adapt um, to, to other um, uh, risks and, and, and convert those into opportunities like um, Sugar Pie did here in, in, in innovating into other products um, that didn't exist before. Um, I think, um, Kristen. Yes, yes, Ali. Yes, yeah, uh, this is Josiah talking. I, I'm just standing in for Ellie. Okay. Uh, um, I've seen uh, Kenneth, Kenneth Mutua is saying that um, Janet Muhia knows how to make uh, ghee and butter. If she can probably tell us a little about it. I think it's on the point that we were discussing just a few minutes ago. I yes. don't know if we can do that now or later. I can allow. No problem. Um, we can close. Yes, on this particular case. Yeah. Yeah. Let me allow uh, uh Janet to talk. Yes. Janet, you should be able to unmute. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Um. Very Good morning. Grateful. I'm really grateful for this opportunity to learn a lot from DTB KBA training and uh, actually seeing that this topic about the shortage of, of butter happened in 2017. And when I was growing up, I, I was able to learn this from my dad because he was taken to the UK by, the, by an organization and he was taught how to do this. And we were doing it at home just for our own consumption. Though I know the process, which is about uh, harvesting the top cream every day, every day. So at the end of the day, this need for plenty of production of milk. So that's why the companies are able to actually produce butter if they are getting good quality milk that produces the good quality of top cream to process the butter so for for business it can be quite some work because you may need to mobilize a group of people maybe in a certain village for you to be able to get the milk from them the top cream and also it's not allowed to harvest the top cream and sell the rest to the companies mm -hmm. so it's quite a process and on the same aspect, when you're doing it handmade and maybe you need uh, plenty of it, it's quite some work. But for home use, for family use, that is something doable. So someone can do business in this if they are able to put the life strategies around and, and carry on from there if there's no problem with the governance that surrounds the milk business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. And I already see someone who is asking for your contact. I think probably you can. Yeah, sure. Uh, you can, yeah, you, you can, can share that. Yeah, uh, I can share my contacts. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Christine, over to you now. Um, thanks, Janet, for that comment. And I think, yeah, it's um, an important consideration when you think about the amount of effort that goes into the production process of milk and you know, the, the issue you raised on separating cream from milk and selling one to one party and one to another. But I think 
um, um, I'm, I'm a way of managing that is looking at your supply chain in total. As uh, businesses, big and small, when you're sourcing for some of these products, whether it's the milk or maybe the tender for uh, butter production from uh, local uh, producers, do you look at um, how, how intensively do you analyze the supply chain or the ability of this um, supplier to, to provide you know, the minimum required quantities of product to you? Uh, do you look at their processes and their vulnerabilities? Because that is a very good indication of their ability to you know, continually provide the service that you're contracting them um, for. So perhaps um, when, when, when we look at supply chain and supply chain risk, this is an important aspect of supply chain. We call, it, we call them sustainable supply chains um, and, and the ability to continually provide the service that one is contracting is uh, an important aspect of sustainability. So in the process of you know, greening supply chains or enhancing sustainability in our supply chains or our third party engagements, it's important to look at the ability of your suppliers and your third parties to build resilience in their own businesses so that they are able to mitigate or manage risks in their production processes that then ensures that you are able to get good quality um, and sufficient quantities of resources that um, you need from them. So business sustainability is not just about your own business operations, but how other players you interact with affect um, your, your business operations or play into um, your sustainability of process. So just um, an add-on to what um, uh, Janet said, which I think is very, very important to consider. Sure, thank you. So um, we have two more case studies and we'll break. I don't know, um, we've been going on for what, about two hours nearly now? Nearly two hours, yes, nearly two hours. So would you propose we take a short um, five minute break and then get back or do we? I think that'll be great with because, because, the, because mm. the, the case studies are a bit intensive with a lot of comments. Yes. We can yes. take a short break and then let come back. Okay, okay. So let's start. Let's make it. Um, let's make it five. All right. Thank you. And for all the questions that have not been uh, responded to, we will respond to all of them. But continue, continue posting them. See you back at uh, ten, ten thirteen, eleven thirteen. Sorry, eleven thirteen. Yeah. Thank you. Right.
right, ladies and gentlemen and business owners, welcome back. I hope the short break was good. Thank you so much for your engagement so far. Um, the session is going well. Uh, continue to engage on the chat. Um, if you raise your hand, we'll allow you to, to make a point, contribute to somebody else's business as well. If you have any thoughts, like the ones coming in, um, one person asking about a business that's in, that's in, for example, technology. Valentine, I see your question. We will answer that. Um, question about Cyber Cafe from Coletta. We'll make sure that at least we touch on all of this as we as we continue. But Karibuni Sana. Uh, once again, today's session is on sustainability. And we are seeing how that is really, really important as, as our trainer is bringing out. So Christine, if you're back, I think this is a good time to proceed. Okay, thank you, Eli. And that was a very quick five minutes, eh? <laughs> Fly I by. hope it has given people uh, at least some time, some reprieve time, mm. so we can continue on with this, the session. Thank you. So, um, welcome back. We'll continue with um, our case studies. So, the next one um, is on the fashion industry. Um, this is mostly your secondhand clothes and um, the impact and opportunities that exist in you know, that market and, and the inverse impact it has um, on the local textile industry. So I have a, I have a, I have a video here um, I'd like to show before we read um, the case study. And then we'll delve into the risks and opportunities within this space. So, Ellie, I don't know why I'm unable to play the video. Is it is it within the representation? Yeah, so it's this picture. It looks like a picture down here, but it's actually um, a video. There should be a play button somewhere. Let's see. Perhaps, perhaps you remove the slideshow. Um. Sorry, I remove what? Slideshow. You can get the presentation off of Slideshow. Let me see if we'll see the, the play button. Uh, you can end Slideshow. End Slideshow. Okay. Uh, and then... And then as you put it back, before you put uh, it into screen. presentation mode. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it looks like you have a small thing. What, what you can do is you can proceed and you can share with me the presentation. Proceed, I see if... if okay. mm -hmm. Just, just a minute, sorry. Um, All right, as, as Christian sorts it out, uh, somebody had asked about whether you can get financing from DTB. 
And I am happy to mention that next week, our session will be on credit readiness. We thought it was a it was an important session uh, because for smaller businesses, um, unlike the bigger ones, the really smaller ones might have challenges accessing credit because of credit readiness. Um, so we'll be having an expert speak on credit readiness, but at the same time, we'll have business people from DTB and you can ask them all the questions about credit as much as possible. Uh, so it will be a very, very interactive session where you can ask all the questions about credit, um, whether you can get it, of course you can get it, what that would take and some of the platforms that we, we use if you, if you, if you so wish to, to get credit. What we don't want to do is take you through some nice trainings and then you, you, you implement a lot of the, a lot of the recommendations that have come off this training. And then in the end, um, not get money for your business when you want it. Uh, so that's why we chose the last session to be particularly on that. Karibu, karibu sana for next week's session. I think that's the Coletta who had asked about uh, that you started a water vending, water insulation. Uh, so, mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, it was Valentine. Sorry, it was Valentine. Thank you, Christine. You may proceed. Okay. Sorry guys, so unfortunately I'm unable to um I think we can we can yeah, also can try, try at the end. I, okay, maybe we can skip that one to to, to the end. Um <clears throat> oh, that's quite sad. Okay. So I'm sharing my screen. Let's just move on to the next, sorry, to the next um, his study. <clears throat> sorry. So this one is um, on the flower industry. And I chose this one um, as, as a good example of what sustainability um, considerations can do for you um, in your business. Um, we all know the flower industry in Kenya has a history has a mixed history in the sense that at some point in time, there was quite a bit of pushback from local communities and employees and even the investor community um, where there were quite a number of uh, um, allegations or displeasure with flower farms for um, you know, violating some of these um, aspects of sustainability. We're talking about you know, your social sustainability, your worker welfare, um, <clears throat> labor laws and all that, um, provision of um, employee PPEs, pollution of, for example, Lake Naivasha or Lake Nakuru, where there are some of these, many of these flower farms are located. And that history was um, that, that push and pull between the different uh, stakeholders, that's your employees, uh, your regulators and the off takers in uh, different markets around the world uh, has helped shape the flower industry in Kenya quite a bit. And, and, and we'll look at uh, how that has impacted um, businesses within um, the flower industry. So the flower, in, and this, this, this is a cutout from um, uh, a, a newspaper. Um, most of my... Uh, Actually, all my case studies are cutouts from um, different news articles um, over time, and just uh, showing how different businesses are, have been able to uh, manage difficulty in in their operations. So, for this, um, it says that by embracing sustainability, the flower industry is not only beautifying our lives but also preserving the planet for future generations. So the flower farms in Kenya have been proactive in adopting eco-friendly technologies, such as the use of hydroponics, water management practices, 
integrated pest management, drip irrigation, rain water harvesting, solar power, and ongoing trials for sea freight or flowers. So by harnessing renewable energy and minimizing water usage, these farms have significantly reduced their carbon footprint, which um, in earlier um, slides we said you can also refer to it as greenhouse gases, as it is also known, while ensuring a steady supply of vibrant blossoms. Moreover, the focus on sustainable farming practices has extended to waste management. So flower farms in Kenya have embraced composting techniques effectively transforming organic waste into nutrient-rich um, fertilizers. So the impact of sustainable floriculture goes beyond environmental benefits. It also promotes social responsibility and economic empowerment. And many flower farms have implemented fair labor practices, ensuring safe working conditions and fair wages for their employees. So I chose um, the fly industry um, for the various um, reasons I've stated, but also um, um, to let you know just how well positioned the Kenya flower industry is globally, is that if you were to attempt to grow similar flowers in a country in Europe, let's say a greenhouse in the Netherlands or in the UK, it will take you about six times more energy uh, consumption in terms of uh, setting up uh, your infrastructure, uh, the greenhouse, uh, the greenhouses, being able to maintain the blossoms through winter, your energy consumption and your carbon footprint therefore is six times higher growing this um, product. And, and, and it's not just flowers, but flowers and horticultural crops as well. So you have your tomatoes and your string beans, six times higher cost um, from an energy intensive perspective than growing them in Kenya. So already Kenya's climate and, 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 and combined with the steps that many um, flower farms and horticultural farmers, many steps that they're taking really position Kenya from a sustainability perspective to be a preferred uh, producer of, of flowers and vegetables in the global market. So already that is a presentation of um, opportunity uh, the risks, obviously, these opportunities have arisen um, because of managing the risks that have historically been associated with this industry. Uh, you will recall many years back, quite a number of farms had issues of um, workers striking, complaining of uh, long working hours, uh, low wages, uh, <clears throat> close to slave type uh, bonded labor, poor community relations because many of these farms were crossing uh, areas between community settlements. So there was restriction of uh, passageways between families living on different uh, parts of the these farms which are interconnected and many other um, concerns over time that have been resolved and that have resulted in Kenya being able to position itself as a, as a world leader in, in, in floriculture and in um, uh, horticultural crops. So there is benefit, and this is not just for flower farms, but for any, uh, um, any, 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 any investor in, in, in the you know, farming and agriculture uh, segment, which is also a very key area of um, sectoral development by the government. You would recall the previous re regime had agriculture as one of its big four agendas, the current regime as well, when it comes to provision of finance, many banks and many investors are quite keen on providing finance for the agribusiness sector. Currently, um, the central bank or the treasury is coming up with a policy framework on, a, on, on green lending, for the agribiz sector. So there's quite a bit of, of, of buzz and opportunity around this, as long as you're able to convert uh, your potential operational risks, whether it's managing your, your water, uh, investing in irrigation, investing in solar power, in, 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 in ensuring that your employees are well taken care of. 
so all those things combined um really really um give good opportunities for um the agribiz sector to 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 thrive and and compete uh, be competitive rather in the international market for which uh, Europe presents a very good uh, of take of many of our products in the agricultural sector. So uh, those examples I've given in terms of managing operations um, will obviously uh, enable the business to manage its, uh, you know, its usual risk, your credit risk, in terms of being uh, credit worthy. When you go to the bank, I'm sure you're all familiar with that term. Uh, when you go to your relationship manager and you ask for a top up or you're opening an account, um, a transaction or a business account, uh, one of the things to be considered for your business is your credit worthiness. How is your credit worthiness assessed? Uh, over and above having a good, um, you, you know, uh, financial statements and 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 and, and spreadsheets. Um, the other thing that businesses, and I think DTB being one of them, is increasingly looking at is how can you maintain the quality of your business? How can you be sure you will be around for the next five to 10 years, regardless of the fact that you're asking for maybe financing for two years? Because the purpose of, of lending um, is not just a for profit on the business side, but to ensure that they are contributing to economic development in the country. So when you look at the, when you go to to to, to make your pitch to, to um, your, your relationship manager or to the bank for funding, it's important to be able to substantiate your financial statements with more than just, you know, your standard profitability. So what are the things play into your profitability? Uh, your business model, what influences your business model, um, how strategic is your business placed in terms of making use of the many emerging opportunities that are there, sustainability being one of them, it's how you have structured your business. So this is this is how sustainability feeds and, and becomes an opportunity, a business, a real value business opportunity. Um, um, for you and 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 I'm sure uh, we've had from as we've had from some of the participants how they've been able to take advantage of different aspects in their businesses to improve um, not just their profitability but even the value they give to their employees, which is an also another good aspect of sustainability. So if if there are any um, comments from the floor, um, I welcome them. But this was mostly um, a, an example to show just how well you can convert risk into opportunity over a period of time. We do um, turnaround time for um, risks is not, is sometimes it's immediate and sometimes it's long term. And this is one of the benefits to draw upon. So any reactions from the floor quickly? <clears throat> Right, while there's none coming so far, there's actually a good idea whether if the video was a YouTube link, we can play it directly from YouTube uh, or share the link with people so they can watch it. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'll, I think I'll, um, we'll make an attempt to do that as we we, we handle the Q&A um, session, perhaps. Great. We, In the meantime, if, if there's I'm, any I'm comments, I'm confused on the fact that we have an hour left yeah, Is it an yeah. hour? Yeah, and, and we have the, still another segment to to delve into. For sure, for sure. I will I will stop you in case there's any relevant comments that come in. Okay, perfect. So the last one um is on um, innovation. Um I think there's this is sustainability is also synonymous with innovation. Um, we all know in order to stay afloat or in order to reinvent yourself or to increase, uh, you know, your growth prospects as a business, um, considerations for innovation are, are, are really important. And um, I chose um, a case study on the transportation sector um, just to um, generate some reflections on how innovation 
and legislation can um, present um, a challenge and an opportunity for, for businesses. Bearing in mind that uh, we all had this, we were all anticipating um, to have a, the long form of BRT, the rapid, the rapid transport uh, system, public transport system that had also much buzz and, and, and investment in terms of reshaping our infrastructure, but um, never took off, which is unfortunate. So I chose this um, because I believe the transport sector is another sec is one of the sectors in which we stand a lot to gain um, by greening either our infrastructure or our modes of transport in order either to cut down to cut down on carbon emissions or to improve the air quality. Um, I don't know how conscious we are about the air we breathe. But if you were to go online right now and look at the air quality, there are different air quality indices um, available online. And if you were to look at one of them, it will tell you Nairobi is uh, heavily polluted or certain areas of Nairobi are heavily polluted. And the major contributing factor for this is the many matatus that are usually um, ferrying people from right inside the city. Uh, if you were to go downtown of Nairobi or um, most major cities, so you have your Mombasa, your Kisumu, anywhere where you find uh, uh, bus stops, that's a, a really strong uh, source of, of, of air pollution. And unfortunately, that translates into lung, lung sorry, lung-related uh, difficulties or, or diseases for the population. So looking at transport, um this is um, an example of <laughs> sorry the use of um lpg uh, conversions in 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 cars um it took on some popularity i think about uh, a year or two ago where there was quite a lot of speak on um, on mostly taxi drivers and uber drivers converting converting their cars um, from petrol into LPG. And obviously recently with the fuel crisis, um, many also uh, using, you know, gas we've seen on social media, using gas to, to start their cars and, and drive um, substantial distances. So this, this photo is from <clears throat> the UK. Interestingly enough, in the late 19, in, in, 1990s and early 2000s, the UK government um, sponsored subsidiaries for um, any member of, of, of the population wishing to, you know, green their, their transportation. And they were converting, they were, they were giving subsidies for people to convert their cars from, from petrol driven to LPG driven. And the same also took a, a popularity in Kenya. So this is this is a very good example of industry innovation, <laughs> either from a point of saving on cost of fuel or from a point of managing uh, one's uh, carbon emissions. But if we were to look at the national, the Transport Act, the Traffic Act rather, we see that it makes uh, illegal, it makes it illegal to convert vehicle fuel types without inspection by NTSA or any change of law that allows alternative fuel. Unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know, um, sometimes we have challenges with lagging legislation and this is one area in which we are lagging in this legislation because there is evidence here in a way that um, LPG fueled cars are not only safe, but they are fuel efficient and they have a much lower carbon footprint than your petrol and your diesel cars. But for some reason, legislation in Kenya is slow and we are still grappling with, you know, the illegality and legality of uh, such, such a wonderful innovation. So the act says that no fuel shall be used in any motor vehicle, except that specific in the vehicle license in respect for such vehicles. So basically what this says is that if you convert your vehicle to LPG from petrol and the license 
for which your vehicle is registered only acknowledges the use of petrol, then you are in contravention of the law. And obviously, if you're contravening the law, then the insurance sector comes in and voids your license. So you become a liability on the road. So this is a good illustration of the difference or the gap between some of the sustainability innovations that come from within us and, and you know, the lag in uh, the legislative capacity to adopt and accept some of these um, initiatives uh, in light of the fact that as a country, we are working towards reducing or managing our um, nationally determined carbon contributions. So on the one hand, for the population, this obviously presents um, a liability risk. If you um, were to get into an accident driving an LPG uh, converted vehicle, obviously that is liability on your end because no insurer will come near you. Um, but I think it's 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 um, worth noting that um, there are some insurance companies that are um, have embraced this type of uh, solution and that are insuring vehicles, but through third parties. So the quality of the insurance is also um, coming up slowly, but there needs to be a better case for use of LPG. So. What um, I was trying to communicate from this is that sometimes in, you might find that the industry is way ahead of the regulator. What happens in those um, situations? You have a few brave souls that they decide to demonstrate and are used as um, a guinea pig, uh, so to speak, in, 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 in demonstrating the viability of some of these solutions. And hopefully the law will, will follow suit and, and, and accept some of these um, industry innovations. <clears throat> so in essence, what I'm trying to say is uh, in instances where legislation is lacking or regulation is lacking, it should not be entirely a deterrent um, for us to, as citizens and as business owners to innovate, because I believe it's just a matter of time before this becomes an acceptable solution, an acceptable transport uh, solution that is both going to be legal and, 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 and insurable in the future. So if you are to look at your business operations, remember we talked about mitigation, and adaptation. This is an, an, an adaptation solution. So if you are to put yourself or you are to take the same concept into your business and look at your business operations, do you have processes or do you have solutions that are ahead of the industry? Um, <laughs> and, and how well, I think the question here to you, um, uh, audience is, do you have any solutions you've seen in your business that can uh, become viable but are not yet uh, considered by the regulatory environment? And what steps, what, what, what are you doing um, about um, your solutions? Are you actively uh, interacting with them as you wait for legislation to find you or are you shy? Uh, because we know sometimes the long arm of the law cannot you know, is 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 double edged. So um, I, I welcome reactions from the floor on this, either on the case study itself or on um, what you're doing within your business in this regard. Thank you, thank you, Christine. Uh, as we wait on the comments. Yeah. May, may, may I ask what? anybody in the transport sector, maybe Uber, uh, in taxi services or personal car that has attempted to use this solution 
um, what has been your experience so far, or what do you think of this as an alternative to the use of petrol in the transport industry? <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a better way to ask it. Um, there's a hand that's up. Uh, I don't know if that's for now. Abdul, would you like to talk so that I can allow you? Abdul, if you hand up because you'd like to, to say something, I've allowed you to, to do so. Um, uh, hello. But, hello. Yes. 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 Uh, no, I, I'm. I'm. I'm enjoying the session. I'm learning. I don't. I don't. I don't have anything to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Where? Where? Come on, come on, So, so if there are no um reactions or comments, maybe we'll take as, as they come up, maybe we'll take them at the end of the session. Yes, yes, we will. We will. Um Kazia says yes, being in tourism, I mean homestay business, also called Airbnb. No regulations here yet, but just moving forward. So we'll take them at the end, yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you, Kezia. But um, when when you consider the, the lack of um, legislation, we have a l lobbying bodies and consumer um, agencies that um, through which some of these uh, innovations can be presented in a case uh, made for. I know the Kenya Association of Manufacturers is one uh, agency or one body that is very keen on uh, supporting its members <laughs> in uh, engaging on issues of legislation and provision of good quality um, services to its members. Um, CAPSI as well. So being <clears throat> members of, sorry, um, these organizations or interacting with um, these organizations is also an avenue for uh, being able to put forward the need for, you know, expansion of legislation to take into, to take into account some of these very unique innovations that um, businesses come up with. So being members of such um, bodies is also important because uh, clearly sometimes uh, and, and, and as time continues to progress, we will see many, many more innovations coming up as solutions to environmental or social challenges. We can't shun them because uh, it's not yet time, but I think a conversation needs to be had. And the only way to have this conversation is either maybe being an implementer and being able to, you know, make a case for some of these innovations so that it is easier for uh, the regulator and, and fellow, you know, consumers to see that there are benefits in, in taking up some of these solutions. So um, we've reached the end of the business case studies. And at this juncture, I'll invite um, some questions or comments that uh, we have not addressed from the previous, from this and in, in the previous session before we go into the final um, application session. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. There's, there's a few of them coming in. Uh, no questions, but I think comments, especially from yes. people who are who are in the industry. Um, Duncan, thank you. Um, this is a, a compliment to you, Christian. Big ups, an eye open a topic and subject. Um, 
Christine again saying in a series of networking sessions with insurance providers to have options for informal sectors that actually work. Because in our opinion, Juakali artisans are really being sidelined. Uh, Clinton says Petroleum Association of Kenya is also one of them. Uh, Alfred is trying to tell us what happened. Immediate savings were made in financial aspects during the change from petrol to LPG. But on the other hand, I think you may want to comment on this a bit, Christian. But on the other hand, long-term damages have been made to the vehicles and as such, majority have reversed, reverted back to petrol or diesel. Mm. Mm. You want to say something about that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yes. Well, in, in the case of the UK, um, I know that uh, one car company was specialized in producing um, engines that are designed to take up LPG. Um, and I think that's where the damage in this case comes from. Um, because of um, the difference in fuel quality and, and combustion ability, the engine suffers um, some strain. So um, perhaps as we continue to tackle solutions in the transport industry, that is a challenge for manufacturers um, in terms of being able to um, design um, engines that are able to take up um, different um, or rather that are tailored to take up LPG as a, as a form of fuel. I know it is a, it is a gap. It was um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a solution that needs to be better um, um, engineered uh, in order to ensure um, longevity of, of, of the vehicles that um, are taking up the solution. So it's mostly, I think, uh, an issue of uh, manufacturing and assembly. Is, is an industry um, to uh, minimize the negative downside from that solution. So that is yeah, an opportunity again that arises from, from that innovation. And Alfred agrees with you, manufacturer specs design is a big determinant. Um, yes. There's a comment here from Florence. I'm also in the automotive industry dealing with car trucker, speed governors and car lamps. We have a few bodies that regulate the market. Mm. Um, Elizabeth Kamau, even real, real estate agent agents board regulates agents and operations, even as we, um, the people in that space, try to find space and voice in our constitution. One here that might attract a comment from just, you, Janet. Just quickly, yeah. quickly, yeah. quickly on the on the on the real estate space. Yes. When 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 you consider um a and a mitigation or an adaptation strategy within the real estate space in terms of um, infrastructure. And infrastructure here being your, your apartments, your buildings, the energy innovations that uh, may be taken up. Um, is, 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 is sustainability a conversation for you um, within the real estate industry? And I ask this because in the more developed markets, you find that um, landlords and, and owners of, of older style buildings are potentially going to um, lose their homes or lose their investments because their buildings are considered either most, uh, mostly energy inefficient. And there are disincentives in place, especially in Europe, to dissuade tenants um, from occupying some of these buildings. So you find that that is a potential uh, market crisis and obviously um, um, a credit crisis for, for uh, the givers of credit for such in investors. So within the real estate industry, um, how are you considering sustainability um, in terms of infrastructure development and provision of services? If, if I could get a reaction from you, I think that would be um, quite helpful coming out from that comment. Okay, maybe maybe you're not in a position to speak, but I think um, it's, it's an important uh, consideration. Um, 
in terms of uh, looking at physical infrastructure and 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 greening of of buildings going forward because i see the trend is usually legislation that is developed in europe is taken up um by african countries with certain limitations or implications on 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 businesses so um it's 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 worth um thinking about sorry eli so you can you can continue with with the comments and questions Hello, hello. Sorry, I was muted. There's a, oh, there's, an, there's a, there's a, there's an IFC certification called Edge that I'm sure a lot yes. of building owners will be going after. And for us, for example, they came and did an assessment of our buildings, so energy use, water use, and materials efficiency. Materials efficiency. And we, we scored quite well on energy efficiency because we tried to, to use energy efficient um, uh, electrical appliances. Um, so we scored quite well on that, but we didn't score very well on water efficiency. But, and the good thing about these things is they're actually quite cost saving. You know? mm -hmm. and, and so we, we, there was a recommendation for us to do something about our water. So just to shock you that the water flow from our taps, for example, has now reduced from an average of five, lit five liters per minute to two liters per minute. You can imagine how much it saves you. And the only thing it took us is installing aerators on some of those steps. So yeah, once we, once we yeah. So once we're done with, it's, it's really simple things. And once mm -hmm. we're done with implementing all those recommendations, they will give us a certification that says our building has achieved level one edge certification. We were going for level one, but it seeming as mm. though we'll actually get level two. Mm -hmm. So so the really simple things that you can do with your with your business to get um, to become efficient and yes. save costs in the long term. But there's there's one yeah. particular comment here that I think you'd be interested in, Kristen. It's from Janet. And she says, I'm in the manufacturing of organic herbal products, mm -hmm. and I am shy from making charcoal herbal toothpaste since I will need to cut down a tree or so, though I have planted many of the type of tree needed, there is smoke emissions in the process. What, what would you say to, to that? Okay. And then um, just to give context, she's at the, she's at the baby step point. Yeah? Okay, 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 that's good. So from the cutting trees perspective, I think... Um, the reservation here is from um, felling down trees, but you've also mentioned that you plant quite a number of trees. And I think um, uh, the key here when you, from a sustainability perspective is being able to replace the number of trees you take down with, you know, um, uh, with more trees. And, and um, you might remember the slogan from Moyera where you cut down one, you plant three. Mm. So that's 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 a, that should not stop you from investing um, in your business from that perspective. When it comes to carbon emissions, um, something um, to consider would be looking at how much uh, carbon you produce from the uh, carbonization process of the charcoal. Um, I say that because. Uh, Remember, we talked about uh, being able to know your emissions and offsetting them. Um, so if you're able to know how much um, greenhouse gas or carbon dioxide or uh, yeah, gases you're producing from your carbonization process, and you're also able to understand um, what number of savings you're making from the trees you have planted that are mature, you are able to know how much you're offsetting and you're therefore able to reduce your carbon foot, footprint. And, and it's a point where if it nets off and becomes zero, then you can actually say your business or your production process is um, is, 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 is uh, neutralized. Um, so if, if you are interested, it, it, it's, um, 
it's a technical process for which you would have to engage um, a technical expert um, uh, to be able to do that analysis for you and give you the comfort of knowing that your business is not adversely um, affecting the environment even as you continue to engage in activities that you know might traditionally be thought to be destructive. Uh, sustainability in the charcoal production process is possible actually. Um, Poland as a country does it and they produce sustainable charcoal for uh, consumption in the EU market. So be, be assured that uh, you're not necessarily negatively impacting the environment if you take the necessary steps to, to look at your process and, and quantifiably uh, you know, give figures to, to, to justify that you know, you're not um, adversely producing harmful gases. Thank I you. hope that answers yes. um, the question. I, I think it very well does. Thank you. Um, and I hope those are the same uh, sentiments and sent sentiments shared by Janet as she as she starts. Thank you very much. Um, Elizabeth, I, th I think you'd, you'd, I don't know if it's a misspelling of the name, that's why I couldn't find it. But you say, yeah, what you have noted is lenders offering financing for innovations. That is true and funds to make adjustments on buildings so that landlords can update their buildings. That is also really, really true. That is something that we are doing here at DTB as well, but, but also just offering, offering financing for purely green, those were, those were uh, doing green projects from the, from the start. So thank you very much. I think, I think the other comment is from Kezia who talks about why we need more cycling areas throughout our road plants to encourage people to use non-motorized, non-polluting, alternative means of, of transport. And yeah, that is, I hope that we can really, um, we can really uh, go in that direction. Finally, we, Dr. Dr. Tari Vinod, before we proceed, Kristen says Nairobi is becoming a concrete jungle, a lot of trees being cut down, some over 50 years old. There's no room left for having trees or gardens but cement blocks, how will sustainability be maintained? Okay, wow. Um, that's um, uh, quite a loaded question. I think so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, interestingly, um, in the process of uh, building infrastructure, um, the project um, implementation process for undertaking any infrastructural development has a segment that requires the developer or the contractor to remediate or rehabilitate the environment post construction. What that means is that at the point of uh, constructing any buildings or any roads, um, the contractor is required by law or through the environmental impact assessment process to replant trees that were felled or destroyed during the construction process. Unfortunately, um, in 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 uh, is it the public uh, whatever body or you, whatever body is in charge of seeing to the completion of such works does not follow through um, with the entire requirements um, for the contractor, which is quite unfortunate. And I think it, it, it um, is a reflection of um, governance on the part of the contractor and on part of the government agency that is overseeing um, these processes, but it is a mandatory requirement uh, for greening or restoring or rehabilitating um, infrastructure. So I think one area that can be addressed is by engaging our, our MCAs and our MPs and holding them accountable to providing us as citizens with a good quality um, environment. So citizens action is, is an important area of, um, of uh, voicing some of these concerns and making sure that uh, contractors um, are held accountable to uh, the work that they're required to do. 
It's 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 um I, I'm for, I'm you. sorry I cannot give you a, a straight cut answer, but those are some of the approaches that um would give best results because that is the standard procedure. Um yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um <laughs> Kenneth says uh, as as you go into the next session, I think one of one of the things that can help was a question asked by I know now we're getting the practicals of it. A question that was asked by Elizabeth that we can provide um, some examples for really, really small businesses such as um, cyber cafes. Uh, so that I'm sure I didn't lose this. Yes, like a cyber cafe, insurance agencies, credit only companies, you know, those kinds. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the next part of your, of your presentation as well. A lot of it has already come out, but Kenneth is, is, um, Quite happy with the presentation says please have a sip of water for that we can <laughs> continue thank you thank you thank you uh -huh. so the next step session is on um, application so the practical process of applying sustainability concepts into your your business big or small and i, I tried to simplify it um it, it can be sometimes a very daunting process uh, with a lot of um, technical buzzwords. I try to simplify it into um, five uh, major steps. Um, so uh, it follows the procedure of assessing your operations, um, determining what is important to you in the sense of uh, carrying out your business what, what areas do you see being risky to you from a sustainability perspective? And how do you convert those risks into opportunities? And then obviously, once you determine that, you define your mission as, as a business, whether it's to become carbon neutral. That means carbon neutral means um, completely being able to offset if it's your energy uh, emissions, or your resource consumption, maybe you use a lot of paper. If you're a, um, 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 a cyber cafe, you print a lot of paper, or you use a lot of power to power you know, the, the cyber cafe and all that. Um, what is your mission around sustainability? It doesn't have to be complicated. It can be very simple. It can be very simple. And then after that, you develop a strategy for which you will um, implement your mission. And then obviously there's the implementation and review process. You implement and then you review to ensure that you're either meeting your strategy or your mission or that your mission supports your business operations. You know, sometimes you can set a mission or a strategy that is misaligned with your, with your core function as a service provider or as a provider of um, goods. So it's important to review the, your processes and ensure that whatever you said you're committed to is actually aligned and supports your business. And obviously you repeat and you continuously improve. Let's see what that looks like. So in the process of assessing your operations, you might have heard of things like materiality. What materiality means is simply the issues of core concern to you as a business. So if I say what is material to me is, um, is 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 say for example a cyber cafe um what what is material to me perhaps is a printing um use of a lot of um, printing paper use of a lot of uh, power to power maybe the computers access to a lot of uh, personal data you know people usually use um, a lot of um, leave a lot of the information on computers. How do I deal um, with that aspect of uh, data safety of people? How do I safeguard uh, people's identities and people's personal information and data? So those are material considerations. So if you look at your business operations, if you're a manufacturer, what is material to you? Um, it could be obviously your water, your waste management, your people uh, management uh, strategies. Um, so it is important for you as a business um, to look at your operations 
uh, your goals and see the issues that affect you um, and, and, and how your business affects um, other people. We saw from the Finley example how its business operations impacted its the operating environment whereby uh, because they had a fallout with their suppliers, the suppliers decided they will, you know, um, bail out on, on the Kenyan tea industry in totality. So sometimes you might find that um, uh, in, in the course of, of running your business, you're affecting other people, both knowingly and unknowingly, um, which we call your external stakeholders. So it's 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 always important to 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 find out from an analysis, sorry, from an analysis of your business who you're affecting and who is affecting you. So that is what we call a materiality. So once you know what is important to you, this is just a table that um, you, one can use to assess you know, whether the things that they've identified, how they're important to the business performance and how they're important to now the external stakeholders like your peers, your, your, your fellow manufacturers, your fellow uh, operators, how, how you affect them and how they affect you. So you have um, the ability to rank a order of importance um, from an environmental, a social, and a governance perspective. Obviously, there are, this is a technical process, um, but there are guiding frameworks to support with this. So you're able to determine Let's say, for example, if you look at your top right quadrant, which is usually your high risk and high importance area of concern, you have things like data privacy and protection, which we look, which we 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 um, consider to be an important aspect for maybe a, a cyber a cyber um, uh, operator. Fair treatment of customers and suppliers is maybe a manufacturer. Uh, your climate strategy is 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 a business in uh, in um, uh, the agribiz sector because it's very uh, vulnerable to climate related risks. Workplace health and safety, obviously, um, for any business, and corporate governance again for all businesses. Um, we've seen that lapses in in governance, top leadership, quality of leadership, and and governance of of operations um, is is a is a key um, factor. Is a is a key factor in uh, uh, long term business performance. Um, so it can make or break your business. So material issues, actually, if 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 you are to think about them, or key concerns for you are the concerns that can make or break your business, either from a performance point of view or from a an external stakeholder point of view. So if your stakeholders are displeased with you, whether it's your, your investors or the community you're operating, if they're displeased with how you run your operations, that can lead to closure of your business or an adverse impact. Again, if, if, if your corporate governance is not good, obviously your business performance is affected and therefore your business is compromised. So on the left side, we have a couple of pictures that depict um, some of the areas or some how to look at uh, your operations. From an external stakeholder point of view, you see a number of guys here uh, protesting. Uh, we know in Kenya, whenever we are displeased by something, the streets are always an option. So how uh, is, 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 are these people rioting, your existence as a business, because maybe they're aggrieved with how you're running your operations or with how you're engaging with the local community. You know, this, this is, is, is um, one way to look at um, operations assessment. So once you know what is important to you and you have ranked all your issues, um, you can begin to allocate, you can maybe determine um, what your mission is in terms of, you know, either turning those risks into opportunities or improving your operations. So you can have a mission perhaps that says a carbon neutral production process. And I'll allow me to use the example um, from one of um, our audiences on, on the 
charcoal um, charcoal production uh, uh, okay. organic products being carbon neutral is 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 very possible for your business and if it's a key mission for you then that is you align your business strategy with something such as that and you say my business endeavors to be carbon neutral in the production process of charcoal which is a key ingredient in my organic products that's a simple mission statement so how do you then begin to um operationalize that mission statement. So your strategy then becomes, which is the next stage. Um, actually, I've already jumped to after defining mission. You can align your mission um, to different existing frameworks, such as the sustainable development goals. And it gives the 17 um, development goals here with example, uh, material concerns, so if you're in the industry for solving issues around poverty, fair wages um, is, is an example um, consideration. If you're solving for hunger, food supply chain is important. The resilience of your food supply chains. Remember we talked about the availability of butter for, for making you know, a bakery products. Uh, food waste, food waste minimization is also another a key material consideration for your for your business. Um, if 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 you're looking about uh, gender equality in your business, if if it's a material concern for you, your board representation, a good complement of uh, men and women, a good complement of skill set. You know, sometimes in making board decisions, you need. Um, um, a wealth of expertise to inform on a decision. For example, if you have a board complement where we are talking about uh, greening your maybe operations and, and, and the board there is struggling to understand what greening operations or uh, improving sustainability in your operations looks like, you can either you know, engage a consultant to support in, 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 in training of the board or hire a board member with that background of experience. You know, depending on the level that your organization is at or your business is at, you can adopt a solution that is is commensurate to your business operation needs. So, if it's innovation and in infrastructure, you've got innovation funding. Um, you've got specialized uh, funding pools like uh, DTB has um, offering for. Uh, landlords or members in the real estate agency in order to you know um, improve resilience or sustainability of, of uh, building infrastructure, all those issues. So it depends on what sector of operations you're in, the nature of your business, the scale of your business, whether it's a big one um, or a small one. Let me tell you, sustainability is not unique is not restricted or unique to just um, big corporations. It, it, it is applicable to all sorts um, of, of, of businesses, both big and small. Mm. So going on the example of uh, um, the organic uh, production. Um, sorry, just give me a minute. I'm running out of saliva here. Yeah. Um, so, um, going by the example of, a, 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 you know, sustainable production or sustainable sourcing of, of, of charcoal for your uh, key ingredients of organic products, um, then you have, we, we've already come up with a mission, example, and said that uh, the mission of this company is to develop a carbon neutral uh, charcoal related organic products or organic products or charcoal or organic adopt an organic um, or a carbon neutral process for its key beauty ingredients for example so you already have your mission and you're looking at your strategy um, implementation strategy so one of the strategies you could adopt here is okay. <clears throat> Sorry, specifically looking at uh, sourcing your 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 timber from uh, suppliers you know 
are growing theirs sustainably. Um, a, you know, timber production or a, yeah, tree stand or forest commercial forest production is also a segment of business that um, a, is done sustainably. So you can preferentially select uh, companies that provide uh, sustainably grown timber, and we know them to be there. So in essence, you are uh, being consciously, you're consciously looking at your supply chain to source from areas that are acceptable or suppliers that are aligned with your mission. You can also improve your efficiencies within your production process. If you look at uh, the bottom right uh, corner here, when we look at the issue of energy, so a strategy can be energy saving approaches, um, getting a kiln or a combustor that you know has a very high um, energy efficiency output vis-a-vis -vis amount of you know um, charcoal you put in it and those um, technologies. So technology innovation is also an aspect of 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 um, practically uh, applying your strategy. Blending uh, uh, resources in your business. We have we were given the example earlier of blending uh, solar power with KPLC to minimize uh, transition losses, especially in the manufacturing sector where you're using uh, heavy equipment or heavy machinery. You know the cost of um, starting up and and and, and running. Some of this machinery initially is greatly affected by downtime from KPLC. So if you blend your power, you improve <laughs> you improve even the the longevity of 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 the machinery you're using. And obviously, um, the last one is offsetting impact. Where well, we're talking about um, cut one, plant three, which was a very strong uh, mantra during um, uh, the Moy era. I don't know why we forgot about it as a society. So offsetting impact here, for example, is you need uh, an acre of trees for your production process. By the time you're harvesting that acre of trees for your production process, uh, and you know you need that acre of trees within um, and your annual uh, uh, resource needs, um, you will have either adopted um, a forest stand somewhere or you will have replanted or planted um, an equivalent or a greater number elsewhere. Um, and there are technical approaches to calculating this um, carbon offsets and it's not just for 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 um, application in trees, it can be applied in any in any business as long as you're able to trace uh, your resources where they come from, whether it's your printing paper, whether it's your energy bill, whether it's your water um, consumption. Like uh, we got the example from DTB, um, being able to quantitatively calculate. Uh, the impact you have, you, the impact your business is having, and, and then looking for aligned businesses or opportunities to offset that impact. Uh, I, I, I hope um, that is clear. Sometimes it gets a bit um, um, confusing um, to follow, but please um, let me know if, if, if um, you are able to follow on the practical applicability of strategy in the business. Any reactions at this point? Okay, um, I'm assuming none. Yeah, none, none so far. I'll let you know when the comments are coming in. Okay. Uh, only so once you've, Okay, so once you've, you've um, moved your mission into a, a strategy, and you've determined what strategy you're going to take as a practical approach, then you begin to apply. So obviously you've gotten your materials, your resources and sustainably, you look at your internal capacity. Um, sometimes it can be as simple as engaging or having a conversation with, your, with either your auditor or your accountant um, who has uh, knowledge on how to 
uh, uh, even uh, move around or work around the budget to you know take up some of this uh, energy saving or resource saving um, approaches like for water or for your waste management. Um, so building your internal capacity, attending um, events such as this to just familiarize yourself with concepts like sustainability and ESG, slowly acquire that knowledge and, and engage with like-minded people. And even um, the bank, which is your investor, uh, asking, uh, getting more information on existing products and services that can help you green your business or improve the sustainability of your business is a form of building capacity. The other approach is to hire experts like um, in, 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 in calculating your, your, your footprint. And this is, this is for all businesses because every business has certain resources that it requires to operate. Uh, so, uh, getting that expertise, and I'm sure at some level, uh, even banks offer this to its clients during either the KYC, know your customer process, or in reviewing the credit worthiness of your business, there is a level of requirement to assess for this internally. So you don't necessarily have to hire a technical expert to do this. You can liaise with the bank um, to get some of these um, services. I don't know if this is true for, for DTB. Um, so maybe it is something worth uh, exploring. And obviously the alternative for the bigger farms is um, contracting uh, specialized help to work um, you through um, this, this, this journey, which is um, um, has some technical, but very beneficial um, aspects to it. So as, um, as I conclude, um, I'd like to say that the initial cost of integrating sustainability into core business and reporting on it can be more than offset by cost savings. Um, so it's not just about realizing profits, but it's also the other way to look at it is what costs have you avoided? How much money have you saved? from maybe changing out your bulbs, um, even in the office. Um, if you were to change from um, incandescent bulbs to, to LED bulbs, the obvious cost savings from that, that is money that you that you can go into, that you can you know, reinvest into the business. You don't necessarily, in fact, sometimes we, we go to the bank to ask for credit uh, and 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 you realize if you were to um, implement some of these initiatives, the amount of credit you would require may even be reduced by some of these initiatives. So it's it's a it's a way of um, managing your finances, um, and and it 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 has both financial and non financial impact because you improve, uh, for example, you reduce your risk for one. Reduced risk we have seen is important in ensuring uh, your business is around for, for a length of time. You improve your brand, you become associated with, uh, your brand becomes associated with sustainability. For example, and it's unfortunate that we were unable to look at the, the clothes, uh, the fashion industry. If you have a brand like the one that uh, we got a comment on, that upcycles its waste. You such statements like this is this this was formerly my kitenga dress. This was formerly something that had a different value um, previously that has been upcycled. It's it's it it improves your um, brand positivity and it allows you to you know um, access different kinds um, of of markets. If you say this is sustainably uh, produced. So also the ability to meet your consumer needs, your investor requirements, your supplier demands, a production obviously of environmentally conscientious products and services is also a benefit towards uh, uh, integrating sustainability in your business. And obviously at the end of it all, 
uh, the initial cost is always uh, more of an investment rather than um, something that eats into your profits. You know, usually the bottom line is usually the profits. But remember, at the beginning, we said it's not just about profits, but pro prosperity. So converting profits to look at your soft and financial impact. So I think um, with that, I'd like to conclude um, this um, presentation. And I think welcome the last round of questions. Um, I know there, there, were, there was an ask around um, examples for small businesses. Uh, maybe we can explore some of those together. Um, from where you sit, perhaps you can tell me, um, considering the nature of your business and looking at um, you know, um, sustainability initiatives, how do you think your, your small business stands to benefit or stands to take advantage of uh, sustainability in operations? I, let, allow me to, to, to turn that back to you and maybe we can have a discussion um, as, as we conclude on, on today's presentation. So thank, you, thank you, Christine. Um, yeah, yes. thank you. I, I, I think the good thing is we've really, we've really captured the essence of it, and we, we were addressing the questions and the comments as they came in. So there's not a lot of comments now, but um, for 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 all the other guys who are still posting. Um, I have enjoyed the dimensions and perspectives taken by Christine um, through, for sustainability. Uh, Mahmoud, you're saying it's a great achievement as a small business to practice the three R's, starting with small things for your business, reuse, reduce, recycle. Uh, mm. Thank you, Christine, for the profound explanations. Uh, <laughs> Um, Elizabeth says getting credit experts from a bank to look at your business and advice is a good idea and less costly. Let's see which other ones are here as well. Uh, uh, Christine has made the session very easy to digest and practical. So I think I think people are pretty much we're pretty much satisfied with what we've heard, um, which is which is really good. Um, as always, if you have any further questions, if you'd like to engage um, Christine further, she's just put up her details. You can take them, and I'm sure she'd be happy happy to help. Um, uh, Boneface Guitar says it's been a good session, more especially matters touching small businesses. I, I think I think today we learned that. There's, there's a lot of opportunities for small businesses as well. And that sustainability is not just something for, for big businesses. A point that we try to drive home very, very much. Um, if, if, if there's no more, uh, any comments in, the, in terms of questions, perhaps, Christine, you want to say one last thing? And then um, there's, there's a very long comment here from Kenneth. Uh, Kenneth, he said, thank you for coordinating the session and to Christine, amazing it was. I hope you all take a thing or two home. Uh, ah, she's done the, he, he's done, Kenneth, you've done the word of thanks for us. Thank you as well for, for attending. Uh, we look forward to hosting you again. Uh, Christine will share with you all these responses later. Uh, but if you'd like to say any one more thing, this would be the time, and then we can close out. Okay, perfect. Um, so I, I really appreciated the interactiveness um, the session um, throughout. Um, it's always uh, heartwarming when um, the, uh, the audience is um, engaging with the presenter. It, it, it allows me to, to um, realize that uh, the session is useful and that um, it is impactful in at least, um, I believe we've all taken away a thing or two um, from today's session. Um, I'm open to engaging <clears throat> at um, a farm level with you if should you um, need support in, in terms of uh, your sustainability um, journey, scoping what that looks like. 
or even assessing um, your operations. So, and I'd also like to thank uh, DTB. I think this is quite some um, commendable work in engaging its um, clients to, you know, understand various aspects of, of um, uh, you know, doing Amy, business. Thank you for your So I think advice. one last... One, one, one last thing I would want to note is that when it comes to um, uh, this session on sustainability, it's important also for the bank because the bank has a requirement to collect some of this information and report on it. So when they are developing new products and services around sustainability, it's important for them to understand you know, what the clients are doing and what the clients' needs are. And so such feedback and engagement with yourselves is important in scoping uh, client needs um, for future products and services. So thank you so very much for your feedback and for your engagement. I am sure as you continue to engage with your um, relationship um, teams and uh, credit members, um, these conversations will convert into more useful um, opportunities for you. So keep up the good work as businesses and, and don't shy away um, regardless of the operating environment you're in. Thank you all so very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, as well. As always, I, I told you guys when we began that we have engaged with Christine before on a number of assignments, and she has always come through in such great ways. And thank you as well. Um, for those who've been attending, those who have attended for the first time today, we are having our... A last session on next week on Wednesday, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, this will be a session on credit readiness. Um, and there's a question here from Kezia who says, "Do you have a soft spot, spot for women groups? Please join next week. We will be handling some of these matters." Then I look forward to hosting you again. Um, and let's continue to yes, I will send um, every single information, including the recording of this session, to you. Um, for your use at any other time, should you so wish. Santeni Sana, see you next week. Okay. Bye, everyone.